Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To all my bed crimers, a happy Sunday. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Let me just ask that after listening to or watching the video, if you find you enjoyed it or learned something, do me a favor, smash the like button. It's a free way you can help me. Now, let's get started. Some of you have been asking for a very long time for an update on the Debbie Collier case, and today I'm happy to finally oblige you. According to an article in the New York Post today, Georgia office worker Debbie Collier's body was 80% burned after she'd been found in a ravine 60 miles from her home. That is according to her autopsy report. The report was conducted by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the New York Post got their hands on it through a public records request. The Post is saying that the report raises more questions about Collier's shocking death, which was ultimately ruled a self-harm situation despite a month-long investigation when it was called a homicide. Just a reminder, in case you guys have forgotten, Collier, the mother to two adult children, was reported missing on September 10th after she sent her daughter Amanda a Venmo payment for $2,385 with a chilling message saying, they're not going to let me go. Love you. Her body was found in a ravine the next day in a wooded area of Habersham County, more than an hour north of her Athens, Georgia home. Officials quickly opened an investigation that bore no results for months, before they made that ruling, calling it an unaliving in November. In the beginning, the police said that Collier had some charring just to her stomach area, but the autopsy reveals her burns were far more extensive, describing second and third degree burns involving 80% of the total body area. The report said, and I quote, Collier died from inhalation of superheated gases, thermal injuries, and a hydrocodone intoxication, end quote. The article in the Post says that Collier often took the painkiller hydrocodone as prescribed by a doctor due to a prolonged back injury. I'm going to quote again. Autopsy examination revealed thermal injuries of the external body surface and of the tracheal mucosa, which is the windpipe, no deposited soot in the airway, and no significant elevation of blood carbocyhemoglobin, end quote, which notes that no other significant injuries were noted. These findings may be due to a sudden intense flash fire as well as the outdoor environment of the fire. Officials noted that a melted gas can was found near the burn site, perhaps the source of the flash fire, but they did not explain the other circumstances. And as we all remember oh so well, those circumstances included Collier being naked when discovered, at least partially naked, and being slightly downhill from the fire, gripping the base of a small tree with her right hand. Medical examiners, according to the Post, said that Collier's face was discovered with third-degree burns, finding charred portions of her scalp and charred leathery skin throughout her body. The autopsy report also doesn't explain how the death was ruled a self-harm beyond a quick line which states, investigation by law enforcement revealed circumstances consistent with a self-intentioned act and that she was alone at the time of the incident. I don't know if you guys remember, but Debbie Collier's rental van was discovered on the side of the road after she was reported missing. The police never bothered to try and explain Collier's Venmo to her daughter, which caught all of our attention, or why she stopped at the family dollar store and bought a rain poncho, 
a refillable torch lighter, paper towels, a tarp, and a tote bag on the day she disappeared. And let's not forget the neighbor who told the New York Post in September that she heard a commotion coming from the Collier's home the night before Debbie vanished, and that the family frequently engaged in screaming and fighting. Her daughter, Amanda, had only returned to town recently with her boyfriend, amateur MMA fighter Andrew Geigerich, a few days before her death. Geigerich told the Post in September that he and his girlfriend were being treated like suspects in the case, but the couple was ultimately cleared of any involvement by the police, as was her husband Steve, who was captured on video at the time of her disappearance working parking cars at a University of Georgia Bulldogs game. Here's what bothers me most from this autopsy report, and that is that there was no deposited soot in the airway. That would seem to indicate that she wasn't breathing when she was burned, because if she was breathing, there should be soot in the airway from what I understand. I'm not a coroner, but I believe this is what the conversations were back when people were talking about this. So I'll be interested to see if any coroners pick up this story and attempt to explain these strange findings from the autopsy report. Is it possible somebody else gave her the hydrocodone, the drugger, and knock her out, and then they lit the fire? How else can you explain no deposited soot in the airway? But again, I'm not a coroner. I don't know. I am going to try to reach out to Jeffrey and see what he thinks about this. And if there are any coroners out there or forensic experts, please leave me a comment, email me, let me know why there would be no soot in the airway. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.